thank you to the uh, organizers, and uh, I really want to thank the uh, the uh, producer panel slash uh, Dr. Hoffman. I found that very interesting, and uh, the the uh, it's it's always good to bring the applied side to presentations and. I wrote a few notes, and I'm going to start with those just to start with because they're so fresh in our memory. But um, one of the things that was discussed is in regards to what people would call or orts or refusals, which is leftover feed from the day before for the lactating herd. And the reason why you want to limit the feed going from an older animal to a younger animal is that there is a disease pressure that is put on a herd if you're doing that. So if you're trying to be, for example, Yoni's free, you will not achieve it by doing that, okay? Because Yoni's is transferred through saliva into the younger animals. Now again, it's a question of percentage and it's a question of, you know, management and stuff like that. That's why you usually try to limit the amount of feed that goes from the older animal to the younger animal. Now just out of curiosity, in the crowd, how would you correct something like feed refusals in order so that you wouldn't have too many, but just enough? What would be your first strategy nutritionally to try to limit that? And there may be a prize to the person who actually answers that question. Adjust quantities. Adjust quantities. Can you elaborate just a bit more? If you're yes? Okay, it's not exactly what I was looking for. Oops, we have another. Better quality. Better quality. You guys are hitting the right notes. Not exactly what I was looking for, but because you answered first, you get the first prize, which is some of our magical pancake mix. It says PNH on there. We're owned by PNH, so you get pancakes tomorrow morning. Okay. Now the real answer I was looking for is adjusting your dry matter. So being, making sure that when your nutritionist balances the ration for your dose, uh, you're actually using the dry matter part of the equation. If your dry matter varies too much, what happens is you get a lot of refusals one day and less refusals the other day. The other thing that I just wanted to comment on is in Western Canada in the feedlots, a lot of people um, live and die by the amount of dry matter that's left over. And the weather actually has a lot to do with how much dry matter is left at the end of the day. So if there's a storm coming or something like that, usually that will make the amount of dry matter or leftovers, um, you know, uh, a, a problem or a, you know, a bigger problem or a smaller problem. So adjusting for dry matter on a daily basis is something that's really important. We definitely push that for our dairies, our, our basically uh, our dairy cow dairies, and on a goat dairy, definitely something you should look into, okay? So we'll get things started. Again, thank you for the introduction. If you uh, are to leave before the end of my presentation, I'm gonna give you the take home message right away, okay? Early nutrition is essential, and it's programming the future of your goat herd Second point, the quality of feed ingredients, um, basically both purchased and grown on farm, affects your profitability. I don't think that's new. And then record keeping is key. Now, Sarah did mention something in the previous presentation in, when she was giving her presentation. What was her comment on record keeping? Bingo, you want to say that louder? You get breakfast tomorrow morning. <laughs> All right, excellent. All right, so you can't manage what you don't measure. So we'll actually cover that a bit. Now again, Kathleen prepared this presentation, so ultimately I do appreciate a little bit of latitude because I only prepped this last night. And, uh, but our thoughts are very similar in a lot of these things, so. Anyway, so from kid to doe, 
Feed program, the feed programs that you'll introduce to your herd are key. They're key because you want to promote health, you want to promote good growth, and you want to promote reproduction slash production, right? So the rule in general is if you were born with a rumen, you're designed to ruminate. So forages are basically a key component for ruminants, okay? Now, I make a living selling feed, but basically, I can tell you, feeding your own feedstuffs from your farm is the most profitable situation for your herd to a point, right? Okay? So what we want to do is, uh, usually rumens, if you have a rumen, and you use your rumen, you will stay healthier, and usually than if you didn't have, um, if you didn't have forages. The big question that came up earlier, and, and I think the both farms commented on the fact that limiting the amount of mole that you have on your forages is critical with goats. And that is a given for any ruminant. Okay? So, a little sidebar. They discussed about the fact that, you know, you can't feed corn silage to herds under a certain size. The big thing is, is can you feed high-quality forages or high-quality corn silage if your herd is smaller? And the biggest challenge that you'll have on making sure that you're feeding high-quality forages is making sure that, for example, on corn silage, your packing density is good. And if your herd is too small, you're, if you're using a bunker system, your face is going to be too narrow and you won't be able to get good packing density. And if you don't get good packing density, Oxygen goes in, mold grows. It's very simple. Okay? All right. Now, Kathleen did uh, talk about creative housing. So, we're talking nutrition, but you say, why is he bringing housing? There's a lot of factors that affect nutrition, okay? And uh, I, I would have respelled that as a creative housing, but it's, uh, it's a nice little picture. So making sure, that, um, making sure that your barn works. The big question in nutrition always comes when you have a higher or over density population in your, in your uh, herd. So the key important thing is, as soon as you start increasing the density of population in a herd, you will have elf issues, you will have feed efficiency issues, you will have reproductive issues and production issues, okay? The other thing is, there is such a thing as heat stress. We wouldn't know this this morning because it was pretty cold getting here. But the uh, big thing is, in the summer, if your density is very high, you will get heat stress. And the challenge with a ruminant is the fact that in order to digest fiber, the dough has to produce a lot of heat. So in the heat stress, when it's hot in the environment, you cannot move that heat fast enough. And that's when they start panting and going into other metabolic issues. So the key thing is, there's a lot of environmental pressures that we're faced with when we're um, feeding production animals, okay? So uh, <clears throat> one of the things that uh, Kat Kathleen highlighted in her presentation, you should look at introducing certain, or changing your ration slightly when you're going into the summertime as opposed to the winter time, okay? There's some key components that you can play with to help your summer uh, production as opposed to your winter production. Next one is um, ventilation. This time of year, we're very aware of ventilation, okay? And again, we like to tighten up those barns to make sure that we keep the heat. The problem is animals really work well with fresh air. So it's always a balance of trying to decide, you know, which one it is. The biggest issue with cold air is that cold air doesn't hold moisture well. And as soon as you start creating big differences in temperature from inside to outside, you will get dew points. Okay? So what does dew create? Condensation. Condensation is water, right? So the challenge with water is, what does it promote? 
Who said that? Mold? You're exactly right. Mold and bacteria growth. Okay? So the key thing to remember is, as soon as you start closing up the barn, you will start seeing your bacterial count in your air and on the surface to start increasing. Okay? And again, anytime you start seeing that, we always use organic bedding, right? That is a fuel for growth of bugs, right? A study that Kathleen pulled out is uh, this uh, Matkovic study in 2007. And uh, if anybody's interested in reading this, it's really interesting, but I will have to send it to you. But the big thing is they looked at animals in a certain environment versus bacteria outside. So what they found is, again, when you look at the uh, inside versus outside, you have, <clears throat> for example, on the bacteria, in 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5 range of bacteria versus outside, 10 to the 3, 10 to the 4. The thing I want, to, I want you to remember about that is, anytime you have a change in that number on the 10 scale, that means it's 10 times more, okay? So anytime you have a change, you're going from a confined space to outside, which is an open space, you will have, uh, you will have a decrease in the amount of, of bugs per cubic meter, okay? Now to put this in context, Kathleen did a cubic meter here, and can anybody tell me how, how many uh, feet in a cubic meter? Roughly. Sorry? Close. Uh, it's close. It's about 35, but in, in that vicinity. So what you're using is you're using this box here, and you're trying to see how many bugs you can fit in this box. So when you go from inside to outside, you're actually increasing it tenfold. Okay? So a cubic meter is not a lot. And that's, you know, 114,000 bacteria in that one box, okay? So it does play a role, okay? So if you have a low population in your barn, and you're not, you don't have a high density, it's not an issue. But as soon as you start increasing the density in your, in your facility, it will ramp up. And that's when you start getting into other issues. Now, any health issue will basically chew up a lot of the nutrition you end up giving to your does and goats, okay? Here's another example that basically this was done on a swine facility, but it's just to show you that it's not just a summer uh, issue, it's a winter issue. And as you go into the winter, you will increase this. In this case, they had a seven-fold increase in the amount of bacteria Per square meter, okay? So it's cold outside, you know? What's important for the animals is to make sure that they do have fresh air, okay? Circulating air is important, so we can't just clam up the facility. We need to get air circulating. One of the things that uh, Kathleen has always tried to uh, uh, tell me, especially with all her experience in young ruminants, is that keeping sick animals in the same environment is always a challenge. Okay, so one of the things that you may want to look into is making sure you're managing your sick animals in an area away from the healthy ones. Okay, if it's practical. So what does this have to do with balancing rations? It has everything to do with balancing rations. Feed is probably one of your biggest costs, okay? And when we're trying to make or create value with things, it's very, very difficult if you're not getting the full value out of your nutrition, okay? So what we try to do is we try to make sure that people understand that the environment is a big factor into your successful nutrition in your does and goats. The most efficient way to produce any, feeds, any uh, farm gate product is always to use what you can produce yourself. And that's why we'll talk about a few factors coming up, like the quality and also developing the rumen of the, uh, of the young um, goats. Rumen development. Basically, if you feed, um, if you feed grain to an animal, 
it'll ferment, start fermenting in the rumen, but it'll also start creating a lot of what we call bug crap. And I spent 14 years working on bug crap when I worked for Diamond V. Um, basically, as soon as you start bacteria producing the fatty acids, the volatile fatty acids that they produce when they ferment, you start developing rumen papillae because that's how they're absorbed in the rumen. Okay? So when I say VFA, does that mean anything to you? Does anybody know what a VFA is? You're right. What are the three main ones that we try to work with? One you like on your fish and chips. What's that one? Acetic acid. Right? We all said that. What's the other one? Propionic. And the other one is smells like Sorry? No, lactic is a little different one. Uh, it's butyric. So basically, if you want to remember this, it's a great, great way to remember the types of acids that we try to m modulate in the rumen. Now, lactic acid is part of it, but usually when we talk about bug activity, we usually talk more about the, the first three. Okay? But lactic acid is a bug produced one, but it's not the one we usually think of when we use of, when we talk about energy in the rumen, okay? All right, where am I? All right, so the best way to grow bacteria in the rumen, okay, the best way to grow bacteria in the rumen is when you balance your energy with your protein, okay? So what does that mean? So basically, energy comes from the digestion of fiber, right? So fiber is a st complex structure, but the VFAs that are produced through that process and the energy that's generated basically has to match the available nitrogen that you'll have in your rumen, okay? So what you're trying to do is trying to balance the availability of both so that you can get as much mi microbial growth as possible. Your best source of energy and protein for a ruminant is always its microbial protein and energy, okay? So what you try to do is, if you have a high fiber ration or your, your, uh, your feedstuffs this year are very fibrous, what should you do? You should actually look into having a very uh, slower release of protein or nitrogen as a protein source. So when you're working with your nutritionist, that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to match what you have on farm with what you have that you're trying to balance with. And that's why we spend so much time doing forage analysis on your farm is because we're trying to match those things. And if you're able to match them, then you're efficient, okay? Um, I think that's pretty much it for that one. So, so where does energy and protein come from? I just said it. It comes from the bugs in the rumen. Okay? And those bugs, what, what can affect the bugs? Just out of curiosity, if you're trying to promote bacterial growth in your rumen, in, in your rumen what can affect the bugs in the rumen? Who said that? Yes. So, <clears throat> Just out of curiosity, what was one of the first antibiotics I ever found? Penicillin. Okay, so naturally in your forages, can you find a source of penicillin? In milk? Well, no, but in mold, yes, because it is a mold. Um, the ones that eat blue cheese, who eats blue cheese in here? It's an acquired taste. But blue cheese is actually in the penicillin family. Okay, so just to let you know that the potential for mold growth in dairy is omnipresent, right? So, and we can affect the bacteria in the rumen many different ways. So that's why making sure that you're staying ahead of your face when you're, you know, preparing your TMR and stuff like that. Mold growth and surface mold growth will basically hamper the bacteria in the rumen, okay? So, so if you're trying to be as efficient as possible and as profitable as possible, you should be promoting good rumen health and good bacteria growth from your, from your bugs. Okay? So in regards to feeding forages, 
when you're looking at a nutrition strategy for the kids, um, basically you're looking at something that's more fibrous because you're trying to develop the muscle effect. And gradually you want to move that to a more fermentative effect, which will basically start stimulating uh, the development of the papillae, okay? So as your VFAs, like we said earlier, increase in the rumen, the blood vessels will develop in the papillae and will start absorbing those VFAs. And that's very dependent on VFA production, okay? For doughings, we're looking at making sure we introduce them to some fermenta fer fermented silages and haylages, okay? Regarding protein supplements, we talked about having, um, you know, protein sources that are either bypassing the rumen or that are easily soluble or are slower release. And again, that's why you want to work with your nutritionist is to make sure you're matching up the right source with what you have on farm. So um, Kathleen gave an example here of, you know, using a supplement versus using a complete feed. Economically, both work, but there is definitely a profitability. That's where you have to work with your nutritionist to make sure that your bottom line is reflected correctly, okay? There's ways to save money when you're making your ration decisions. Okay. This is an example of the software we use to balance rations. And you can see that there's a lot of factors that come into the play, but that's why we want to make sure that we're able to analyze your forages and match them up to make sure that you're as efficient as possible. Making feed decisions to generate profit. One of the key ingredients to making sure that um, you're producing the most efficiently as you can is to make sure that you're growing the highest quality for your needs. So the highest quality feeds that you'll end up having on farm is going to be critical. So one of the things that, um, that you can look into is if you start producing higher quality ingredients, you'll, produce, you'll, you'll improve your rate of gain. Um, one of the things that will definitely be reflected is your cost of production. And then hopefully it'll reflect in your components and you'll be shipping more components in your milk. So this all comes when you're planning your forage year, okay? Making sure that you're able to look at what you did last year, the analysis you had last year, and should you be making changes for the upcoming year. Now I know we can't predict weather, but the big thing is you can actually see where your limitations are. Right? So if you can only schedule two days of harvesting uh, per month because, you know, you're contracting or something like that, you need to look at that. You need to make sure that you're able to get the highest quality forage. And that means that you need to get it when you can. Now, if you're in a situation where you cannot, um, you cannot budge much in regards to uh, your timing, then that's when you have to look at the different varieties that you'll have. So <clears throat> making sure that you're hitting harvest date at the right time is really critical, okay? So if you, um, if you have a lot of undigestible characteristics in your hay or your haylage, for example, then that, what that's gonna do is it, it's gonna create more bug activity, but it's gonna slow down the whole digestion process and that's not necessarily good for your volume, okay? So, uh, yield versus nutrition. I always like telling my dairies because even though I manage this team uh, at uh, New Life, I actually have accounts of my own, so I have to do the rations and the sampling and stuff like that, so. Key thing is, I always tell them, always think dry matter first, and then aim for the best quality you can given the conditions you're in, okay? so. Dry matter first, because the last thing you want to do is be in a situation where, and this, this year was a really good example, where we had um, people running out of corn silage. Um, a lot of herds, maybe more on the, uh, the lactating dairy side, 
we had a lot of herds that were actually running out of corn silage. And it's just because our harvest window got extended by two, three, four weeks, for example, right? So allowing yourself to have enough dry matter storage so that you can give yourself a buffer and you're not running out of dry matter. Because I can tell you, if you want to disrupt a rumen, you start making big changes every other week on your ration, you will have issues growing bacteria. Because a lot of the fiber digesting bacteria that you're trying to grow take many weeks to establish. You may see a, a blip right away, but it takes many weeks for them to establish, and they're very pH sensitive. So if you have huge swings in your, in your consumption or your sorting, et cetera, that create acid flux, you will have issues with the bacteria and the fiber digesting bacteria in your rumen. Okay? Uh, for example, um, Kathleen gave uh, an example here of uh, uh, having issues with harvesting. When you're looking at um, alfalfa, for example, each day that you're past your optimal point, you will be losing basically points in quality of that alfalfa. So making sure that you're tracking your fields well and you know exactly when your harvest window is, is critical. And then look at that weather map. Okay, because that is your farm profitability. Okay. This is an example, uh, Kathleen um, gave an example here of making sure that if you have a hard time hitting some of those harvest windows, looking at the types or the mix that you're actually growing, where you can have different maturities at the same time. So you may not be having the top quality but you'll have an even quality over a longer period. Okay? Does that make sense? I see nods. Have I lost everybody? <laughs> All right. So last thing here is um, we have peas and oats as an example. So making sure that you're able to use some of these dual crop situations in order to get some bang for your buck. Um, in, 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 a, in this example, um, peas and oats would be more of a strategy for dolings and uh, meat goats. But uh, again, being able to time your harvest when you're using that type of strategy, you can actually, uh, the, the window for a lactating doe versus a meat, uh, meat goat is different. Okay? So basically you have to manage for what your production is. And again, um, just an example, for example, if, if you're trying to get more lactating value out of this type of strategy, um, Kathleen mentions that you should be harvesting at the boot stage, right, for the oats. So that's just an example. For non-lactating, um, you know, usually what you'll try to do is try to increase the amount of yield you get out of it. So that's always the compromise. If you extend yourself past your harvest window, the more you extend yourself, the fiber content goes way up and your protein content goes way down. Okay? And this is why, this is where we come in. If you want to maximize your success when you're feeding lactating animals or meat producing animals, we need to do the analysis. That is critical. So having this analysis, and again, these tests now, we can run in basically 24 to 48 hours. So having these tests and knowing what we're doing, keeping a log of this in your notes, saying this type of crop, this is what it created, use some of your benchmarks on the analysis so that you can predict next year. Those are all key components to being able to maximize your use of forages and minimize your cost of feed, okay? So, one of the other ways that you can set a benchmark is by creating your own little ratio of income over feed cost. That's a very simple one because feed is usually probably your highest input that you're purchasing. So creating this value on your herd 
is a good way to see if you're moving ahead or you're not. Okay? So if you need help with this, uh, we can definitely help you. And one of the things that I would recommend is, it's a very simple math equation, but it can actually help you look at your monthly, daily, and yearly profitability. Okay? And again, you have the formula in the handout. And there's a typo on this slide. Does anybody notice it? It's not reduce. It's actually, it's to improve your income over feed costs. Okay? So, again, I noticed that last night, but I just wanted to make sure you understood that you should correct that word. Okay? So ways that you can improve your income over feed costs is basically by having quality ingredients, and basically quality ingredients from your farm, okay? So um, when, when it comes to um, management, for example, what would be a big driver that we talked about early in the presentation, what would be a big driver on improving the barn slash feeding management part? Does anybody remember? It rhymes with dry matter. Dry matter, right? So doing daily dry matters, making sure that you don't have tons and tons of refusals, right? So doing that little simple equation, making sure that your nutritionist knows what your dry matter is. And even if you don't want to start doing daily dry matters, look at doing weekly dry matters just to start, okay? So key thing to remember is all of these things will in affect your income over feed. Okay? Um, one of the other thing is, uh, when we talk about competition here at the farm level, what does that mean? Competition is usually density, right? So making sure that you have enough bunk space, you're doing your push-ups, if you have percentages over but your capacity is, you want to make sure you push up more frequently because you want to make sure that every time those does or meat goats want to access feed, they need to be able to access it. Okay? So the key thing to remember is your density will affect your profitability and basically what you want to do is to make sure that you're able to manage through that. The other thing is when you look at, again, density issues, you're looking at disease pressure. So anytime you start increasing the amount of animals per uh, square foot in your barn, you increase the amount of bacteria per square meter, and then basically your risk to disease increases. Okay? So again, one of the key things that you can do to help yourself in this is being able to test your forages. And if anybody has any questions on what would be a good strategy for testing feed, don't be afraid to ask me, your surgeon, before you leave today. We can actually help you with that. But the, uh, or any of your old, other nutritionists that are here. Big thing is, um, what we try to do is try to maximize always your on-farm forages and then balance them out with what you have, with what we can add. Speed, that whole speed of nitrogen availability in the room and then all of those things, okay? Again, who said that little phrase earlier, right? About record keeping, you can't manage. So Sarah, that was a great comment that you added to your, uh, to your presentation. You cannot manage what you don't measure. And I would highly recommend that when it comes to forages and your strategies, make sure that you're able to document what you did this year and where you want to go next year. Because this is when you should be looking into it. Actually, you should have been looking at when you're buying your seeds and stuff like that, especially for corn silage. But those things are really critical for your success. Okay? Make sure that you're also able to measure other parameters. Your income over feed costs is one of them that you should be looking into. Very simple math. Okay? So again, my take home today, and I started with that earlier, is that your nutritionist, from basically kid to dough, is critical for your success long term. Okay? 
quality of your feed ingredients, both that you have on farm and that you purchase, is, other, is another one that's really critical. Okay? Record keeping is also one of the key things for your long-term success. I know that it's difficult because it's, it's extra work, but any time you're able to document the fact that some people are using AFI in their, in their, in their uh, dough barns to measure volume of milk and then you're using that tool to wean them or to select them if you're going to rebreed or not, those are all critical things. Okay? And on that note, what I would say is, if you have any questions, I will field them. If I can't answer them, I will ask Kathleen to send you an email once she is available. Thank you very much for your time. And did I make it through in time? We're good. Thank you. <laughs>